Yeah, so I don't know, should we start? Yeah, let's start. Let's start at the start. I'd wish I'd be at the Galleria Nazionale, uh, the Arte Moderna in Rome, but I am, of course, not. Uh, I wish I were there too. So instead, could we pretend and you can give me a walkthrough? <laughs> yeah, we'll pretend with, uh, with Google Street View and see what's coming out of it. It starts smack when you basically arrive at the uh, place itself. As you can see, this is very much a 19th century kind of sort of like wedding cake sort of concoction. You know, it has something going on everywhere. And as you walk into this place, what you notice is that it actually has these lions hanging out in, uh, in front of it. These lions, of course, are uh, created uh, contemporarily. They are by an Italian artist called Davide Rivalta. The lions in front of the Galleria dell'Arte Moderna, I think, are perfect because of this historian differentiation between the contemporary and the 19th century. And as we go inside, we will see that this is basically happening all the time in this museum. What the director, uh, Christiana Kolu, did, and she did this better than every anybody else in the world, is to completely mix it all up. And what we are looking at here is really one of the major rooms. And let's, you see a gigantic sculpture in the, in the very center of it. And this is a obviously 19th century sculpture by a guy called Antonio Canova, who really was the single most famous artist of, of his time. And what you have here, of course, uh, up front is a, a sculpture of Hercules, I think being extremely nasty to a messenger to Lika. If we would be there live, you would be extremely aware of the unbelievable motion Kanoa is able to get of that giant block of stone. I mean, just look at how these, this super, super thin fabric is able to go down in front of his six pack there. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing piece of art. And uh, it is, uh, place smack in front of this piece uh, of this Arte Povera piece by uh, Pinone. This piece that we see here is made out of thorns. I think it's thorns from the acacia tree, but you can see the way he arranged them on the canvas. All these tiny little dots are pretty big. I would say almost an inch high thorns. And then he has that little piece of gold leaf in the center of it, almost like a procession. I think that uh, you can read many things into there. For me, this looks very much like a mountain range or like a valley within a wooded mountain range. Uh, it's, uh, I would say, it's pretty damn gorgeous. In the context of the gallery, you really have that as the sort of landscape in which that the figure of Hercules stands. It's really, it's powerful visually. Yes. You know, she has set this scene and there's even a lake in front of them. I mean, this is literally genius to to place this uh, uh, this 19th century Canova piece in front of another Arte Povera artist, where it reflects. It's almost like a reflecting pool uh, in this whole thing. I think is just uh, genius. So yeah. I say. Let's move on, no? Let's say if we go to the this room here, that where we see a Giacometti sculpture. This is one of his Venice women uh, uh, placed here. And look how she hangs it in front of this Morandi. Now, this is clearly a formal combination. You have these very thin forms in the Morandi still life, and then you have this very thin form of the of the Chakometti in front of it. Chakometti really left these fingerprints instead, and I think that he made these women out of plaster. They were later 
you know, uh, uh, cast in bronze, but he made them out of plaster and it was sort of like to show that there is a never-ending possibilities of form. Morandi really being almost the opposite because he super, super carefully selected his uh, selected his pieces. He sometimes take him days to select the bottles or the cases or the color of the, the background or of the tablecloth that he would place his, his assemblage on. I love that contrast between the two. Yeah, it's, I think, formally extremely strong, extremely similar, even though they arrived at this similar form in a very, very dissimilar kind of way. I always love encountering a Giacometti in the gallery because I always feel like it's a real presence in the room with me, you know? It's like all of yeah. a sudden, oh, right, I'm a body. I'm here too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we go to the next sort of like bigger room. Now, mm -hmm. if we start with the big landscape, that is Giacomo Balla, and it's basically uh, like he later on made these very typical futurists. I mean, he was the, one of the central futurists painting, you know, that basically celebrated speed and, you know, saw speed itself as a new kind of form. And so here you could say, oh, Placing the bicycle wheel in front of it has some sort of relationship to that park. But then, of course, what we see here is a Marshal Duchamp piece, one of his most famous pieces, one of the very early ready-made, surely one of the single most influential pieces of early 20th century art of all. When he first tried to exhibit these pieces, everybody hated them so much and that nobody Paid, basically paid any attention and these things were thrown out. I know that his toilet, like the, it's called Fountain from 1917, I think was photographed by, by Stieglitz and Stieglitz just disposed of it afterwards, basically just threw it out. Actually, looking at these galleries and the Google viewer, it's actually really nice to be in there alone yeah. without yeah. other people because you can see these conversations between the artworks so clearly, I think. If it were crowded and if you were sort of negotiating each piece and looking at them piece by piece, it would be harder to think about those relationships. Exactly. So I wanna move on, but so we are now in a another very, very large room, as you can see. And this is a room that actually does have a subject. It is, this is a thematic room. And it's a room about war. We see two gigantic, sort of like 19th century war paintings. Both of them, of course, are real, uh, proper uh, war paintings. Like, you know, they've been commissioned as a, as a memory of war. And once it was combined with this fighting dogs over here, they are quite realistic. They're extremely, when you're there, when you see them in the flesh, they're extremely aggressive, meaning that even though they are clearly bronze sculptures, they make you feel uncomfortable. And then you have an expression, an, uh, an abstraction here made out of plastic. And this is a piece by Buri, maybe the most famous of all the Alte Povera artists. I think this piece really is made out of various parts of plastic, sort of like burned, and there is an incredible aggression in this place, uh, in, in this piece again. And then if we go quickly out into uh, a space, so this is the veranda, an adjoining room on one side of the war room that we've uh, that we've just been, and even though we still are in a room of abstraction, the mood changes totally. It changes because you have all windows, so it's a lot of natural lights coming in, but also suddenly it becomes much more technical, more brainy, less emotional. It's a brilliant installation of the collection. And I really appreciate how much, especially in this last, in the veranda room, how the architecture is so much a part of the conversation. If you go there, 
I can basically guarantee that you're going to be blown away. That's great. Well, thank you so much for giving me a walk through this remarkable museum and exhibition, and I really appreciate it. It was a true pleasure. Really easy. 